Mark, you just told us about that story, but I want to pick up the conversation where we just left off. Interestingly, um, you were telling us your understanding of the Supreme Court case. You've been going around talking about Janus rights, and you were saying that um, every worker has an option to either join the union or not join the union. But if you join the union, you are yielding your First Amendment rights to the union. The union now gets to speak on your behalf. And the court said they basically need to be given notice of that when they take the job, almost like you're given Miranda rights. Those are now called your, quote, Janus rights. And you're having um, you're doing education around the country trying to implement that. I wanted to ask a little bit, how is that implementation going? How is the, I mean, this case came out like five years ago, right? And how is the um, catch going? We know, Nikki and I went to law school, sometimes the court um, does something like Brown versus Board of Education, the integration of schools, um, getting rid of segregation, but that doesn't mean it happens right away. So how's Janus rights going? Well, it's it's kind of a tough road, uh, Kelly, and and that's primarily because uh, the unions are doing everything they can to circumvent the decision. For example, uh, on the day of the decision in 2018, Governor Jerry Brown in California signed a new piece of law into effect that states that if an individual that's a member of a union goes to a supervisor and asks, well, can I get some more information about this Janus rights and you know what's it all about? The supervisor cannot talk to him about that under penalty of law and the supervisor is to direct him to the union. Now, what could possibly go wrong with that idea or scenario? Uh, in, in the state of Illinois, for example, they passed a law that said that the union gets a mandatory meeting with every new hire at the beginning of the intake process. However, is the other side, uh, such as my side, if you will, be given the right to explain to people they do not have to join and they do not uh, you know, necessarily have to sign that union card? No, mm -hmm. it's all one-sided. And there are other states besides Illinois that have done the same thing across the country. Um, and the unions have done everything they can to circumvent the process, even to the point of if you did want to try to resign uh, and get out of the union, or what's now known as opt out, unions make it incredibly difficult. Um, they they put in all kinds of what's known as windows, where you can only with uh, oh, withdraw yeah. from the union, you know, maybe for a particular two week period, uh, one month out of the year. So in essence, what you're doing is you're giving up your rights for 50 weeks out of the year um, and only being able to exercise those rights for two weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, you know, uh, suggest that if somebody had that same right that's within the Constitution, let's say the Second Amendment or any other of the rights that we are offered, there would be a total uproar, unbelievable uproar that you can only allow your rights to be exercised two weeks out of, a, out of an entire year. I mean, it's abominable. Right. Let's think of it that way. Well, it's interesting to hear your take because I remember when I served in the cabinet for the governor of Alaska, I was in charge of personnel and I was in charge of implementing the Janus decision. And so we were supposed to change our rules to require a um, directive that we got direct communication from the employees, like a card, uh, just like you're saying, where they said um, they wanted their union fees deducted from their paycheck. So they directed me and our HR department, yes, please deduct my union dues so that we didn't assume that they wanted their First Amendment rights violated. And immediately the unions filed lawsuits against us, putting a stay on that. And in until it's resolved, the fees were continuing to be automatically deducted from the government and no notice was being given to our employees that their First Amendment rights were being um, ceded over to their unions and their paychecks were automatically being deducted for all their um, agency dues. Um, so I thought it was a little bit weird because as a government, um, government authority, I'm sitting here at the paychecks coming out of my finance department before it ever hits my employees. I'm 
reaching in, pulling out dues, and then handing it to a third party organization. I'm not taking out their PTA dues or their gym membership dues or their membership to anything else, their country club or anything else. We would think that that would be absurd, right? Uh, government doesn't act as your third party dues collector managing your, your paycheck deductions for everything. Um, it, it didn't, it just didn't seem logical to me. That, to me, if your union is doing its job of representing you well, um, serving its client base, just like any other organization, then it can manage collecting its dues from its client base, just like every other organization, right? It There was this huge fight that came up, just like they did with you. All of a sudden, I was a union buster because I was trying to implement the Janus decision, but it didn't make any sense to me. There's nothing union busting about it. Um, why are you getting government involved in a relationship between an employee and its organization that for all other purposes, government's required to stay out of. We're not allowed to communicate uh, with the employees about anything going on between, uh, anything that could be related between the union and the employees. Um, that That's a very protected relationship under labor rights law. I thought the whole thing was really interesting. Um, what was your response to criticisms about union busting? Because you've been dealing with this now for several years. How how do you address that when it seems like your intent as a government worker was to protect union rights? You deal with this with the Janus rights advocacy that you're doing now, but you were dealing with it even when you were an employee. For people who are listening who might want to take a stand on this issue, how would you equip them with responses to allegations or accusations that they're union busting? Well, I think it's a, uh, the idea that the union business model, if you want to, if, uh, to use that analogy, uh, is so outdated and their usefulness in some areas has been put into federal and, and state and local statutes, such as how many hours in a work week. Uh, we have OSHA for company safety. Um, you know, we have health care that's been implemented and so on and so forth. These are all fights that have been won, you know, back in the 20s and the 30s and the like. But yet I find it very interesting that the union bulletin board at my work uh, uh, had a had a big poster that said it was the union that gave you the 40 hour work with and gave you health care and gave you this, this, this and this. Well, yeah, they did back in the 20s and 30s, but they're still trying to take credit for it um, and the like. And their business model has now turned more to politics and policy and keeping their power, uh, keeping that ATM machine running, if you will, um, so that they can back the candidates to support them. For example, uh, out of every dollar that a union collects in dues, less than 20 cents of that dollar actually goes to wage and benefit negotiations. The balance of it, or close to 80 cents, uh, goes to some overhead and, you know, the administration of the union. But the majority of it goes to political purposes. Hmm. And it also can be used not necessarily on a dollar for dollar basis, but it can also be used as an in-kind basis. So let's say that you're running for office. You can have a whole bunch of union workers out there putting up signs, going door to door canvassing, et cetera, that uh, amount to other more than a millions of dollars in additional funds, if you want to put a dollar figure on it, um, it's over and above what they collect in dues. And if you also look at where this money goes, it's it's primarily you know to the progressive left, and it's primarily to an area that I believe a lot of uh, union members just don't ascribe to, but they're kind of caught, you know, between a rock and a hard place.